If you got your Bibles, we're going to go back to our base scripture. We're going to read one passage of scripture, one verse of scripture. I want you guys to memorize this. I really do. This, this all, I've, I've said it enough that you ought to already have memorized it. But I want you to make a, a concerted effort to memorize John 17, verse number 23. We're going to read one verse, and we're going to get into our, our lesson text today. John 17, verse number 23. Um, and so if you're trying to, let's read it together out loud and on purpose. Are y'all that ready? Now, again, when you come to church, let me just kind of share, share with you. When you come to church, and, and, we, and, and I'm asking you to read out loud. One of the reasons why I'm doing that because you need to hear those words coming out of your individual mouths. Are y'all with me today? Words, uh, God chose to use word to speak the world into existence. God talks an awful lot about prayer. And the words that we say have impact. Death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it eat the fruit thereof. So our words are important. So when you hear God-ordained promises from the Holy Scripture, when you, when you hear the words of Jesus being articulated, it, should, it, it, it has a way of, of building our faith up because faith coming by and hearing by what? So let's read out loud together on purpose, and I want to share a, little, a couple of things with you before we get into this lesson text, okay? The Bible says this, and this is Jesus praying. Of course, you know this by now, right? He's praying prior to his what? How long have we been on unity? He's praying prior to his what? His impending crucifixion on the cross of Calvary. Don't tell me y'all didn't know that after all these weeks. All right, y'all know, y'all just, sometimes you get put on the spot like that, all right? Now, y'all know this. Listen, I, I, I don't mean to, to, to disrupt anybody's peace when you're in service. But there are times I'll just point to you and say this or, or say this. I may even call your name just arbitrarily because it, your name comes out. But please don't take it as anything personal. But you ought to pay attention because if you sleep and I call your name, I'm just joking. Nobody should be asleep right by now, okay? I know you got up a little earlier this, this morning, right? So, so tell, say, body, make the adjustment. All right. Text says, I am in them and you are in me. Jesus is praying here. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Wow, that's Jesus talking there. Now, guys, we have a very important role uh, in the promotion and the, and, the, and the advancing of kingdom agenda here on earth. I, I, this has been uh, uh, March 15th of 2020. I remember that day very vividly. That was the last day that we had uh, service before, uh, because of the global pandemic, they, they decided that we could not gather uh, like we had been gathering up to that point. So we're, it's basically almost two years to the day when we stopped meeting uh, for a period of time. Uh, we picked back up in June uh, and, and were able to navigate for the, you know, since June of 2020. There are some churches who, uh, you know, were out for a year, year and a half, two years. Um, and, you know, to each his own. But, you know, I, I, I said this, if there's a way that we can do something uh, safely, and then we do it. And so I, I thank God for your cooperation and your, uh, uh, your ability to adapt and adjust so that uh, what God was trying to do through the ministry work here did not cease for one Sunday, okay? So I thank God for that and thank God for you. But, but there's some things. I, I ran across this article, and I, I, and I want to share a, a few stats with you because I think sometimes we don't recognize sort of where we are in, as, as a nation and where the church is headed to and how important it is for us as a body of believers not to, not to give in, not to give up, but to continue to stand strong in our faith walk and realize that what God is wanting to do through us is much bigger than just EBC. Are y'all with me? So, uh, but uh, I ran across this article and I, and I thought it would be good to share some things with you. Uh, uh, Tom Rainer um, uh, wrote this and, and shared some stats. He says, uh, do you remember the first Sunday your church did not have in-person service due to the pandemic? 
That Sunday marks the beginning of your church's quarantine period. For some churches, the period lasted a few months. For others, the quarantine lasted well over a year. Uh, there's this group that calls Faith Communities Today that, that does studies on churches and church trends. Uh, and they, they've done this for, uh, you know, ever since year 2000. They, they conduct uh, church surveys. And, the, and, and in, their, in their study, this, uh, this group here used their studies to do some comparison of what, what the church looked like today, okay, compared to some of the 15,000 or so churches that they survey on a regular basis. But, but there are five, five metrics, uh, five key data points that I want to just bring to you here and real quick. So l churches before and after the quarantine, here's what's happening in Christendom today, okay? Number one, before the quarantine, the median worship attendance, the median is, is the number in the middle. There's equal number below and an equal number above that, 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 that number. That's the median, right? It's not an average, it's the median. Equal number above, equal number below. Now, they, they surveyed over 15,000 churches. Before the quarantine, the median worship attendance was 65. Today is 55. In year 2000, look at the trend, it was 137. In year 2010, it was what? 105. In 2020, it was what? 65. And today is what? See, the fact remains is, is the pandemic didn't run folk off. Folk been running off for a long time. Are y'all understanding me today? Medium worship attendance has declined by 60% in two decades. Now, I want you to think about that. It's declined by 60% in two decades. What does that tell me? The falling away has accelerated as we are getting closer and closer to the end times. And this is what the Bible predicted. When you study Bible prophecy, there's going to be a great falling away. And again, people think the pandemic did it, but you know what? The pandemic just exposed what was already there with people. Look at this next point. The occupancy rate of worship centers was 33% before the quarantine, and now it's 28%, 28%. Uh, EBC's occupancy rate currently probably about 60% full here, 55 to 60% full here uh, uh, currently, and I know some, the, the hour spring forward knocked them back a little bit. <laughs> How many of y'all got up a little bit later than you normally do? All right. Uh, so, some, some were anticipating you, your body adjusted well, but, but again, uh, we're about, I'm going to guess about 60% uh, capacity today. Uh, and so, so, so that's, 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 it was 33% and now it's, it's 28%. So that, that, that causes church to try to think about, okay, when it, when it comes to facilities, uh, is it always wise to build bigger? To build bigger because you build it, they'll come. Not necessarily true. Are y'all with me? Uh, the third one is one that um, we may not think much about, but says the median year of church founding was 1950 before the quarantine, and that has not changed, okay? Uh, and what, one of the reasons why they measure this is they measure it from the standpoint of church plants. Because we as a church ought to always be looking to see how can we expand the gospel message. Most churches are thinking about how can we get our church full? And we ain't even thinking about going nowhere else. But what about those areas that are underserved with the gospel message? Oh, if, if, if we're not planting, we should be supporting organizations that are planting churches in underserved areas. Simply stated, not enough new churches have been planted to move the median founding date significantly in years. So, so we're not opening new churches. The fourth thing I want you to take a look at, the median income of churches was 120,000 before the quarantine. That has not changed, uh, which is, is, is somewhat of a, it's a good point because I've talked to a lot of different pastors and they said that during this process in this whole past two years, uh, the, the, the giving levels that a lot of churches have, have, have remained the same or, and or increased. Um, in actuality, now, now, now again, there are a number of them that have closed their doors because of this, uh, but, but I will tell you that we are blessed as a church, this 120,000 uh, budget number, we passed that back in 1995, I believe. Uh, and, and I thank God for your support of the work of ministry because we're, we're north of a million dollars in budgeted receipts. 
That's because you give and you support the work of ministry so that we can do ministry at a high level. So I thank God for you. But everybody's not there. The average church budget is 120000 The median, The median is 120000 per year. But it takes money to do ministry. It takes money to do this live stream. It takes money to, to, to have an internet connection that doesn't buffer when you're trying to upload all this stuff. Hello, behind the scenes folks. We battled with that for a long time to finally we had to say, we got to get a dedicated internet line that's not a party line where if everybody jumps on, then now your stuff slows down. But it takes money to do that. Are y'all with me? So I thank God for this church. And we don't, we don't beat you over the head. We don't strong arm you. We don't have a, a $2,000 line. Some of y'all don't know what that, some of y'all have no clue what I'm talking about, do you? We just tell you, as a matter of fact, we don't even pass the bucket anymore. We trust that when we teach, you'll be obedient and give. And I thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if y'all want to pass the bucket again, we can start passing it. <laughs> I'm just joking. But thank God for this. Okay. And, and, and lastly, the percentage of churches with an attendance under 100 before the quarantine was 65. Now, li listen, the lower this number, the better. Okay? Listen to this. The percentage of churches with an attendance under 100 before the quarantine was 65%. Today is 75%. And in the year 2000, it was 45% that had attendance under 100. We are fast becoming a nation of small churches. See, sometimes we look at church life, we, we look at the big church, and we think that's the norm. That's, that's abnormal. Mega churches are abnormal. All right? But what I will tell you is, is that as a body of believers, we want to reach as many people with the gospel message as we can possibly reach. Because when we reach people, then we end up changing our communities. Are y'all with me today? We, we, we change, when we reach people, we change that, that, that person, we change that family unit, and that family unit changes that street that they're on, and that street changes the community they're in, and then now we all of a sudden we have transformation in our communities. Guys, let me tell you something real quick. Just having recreational programs ain't going to stop folks from killing each other. Amen. That needs to be a change of heart. A change of mind. And until you can get your heart and mind changed, you need to be locked up somewhere. All right. Can we keep moving? Now, guys, I told you on last week, and we talked about uh, this, this next component of, of, of Jesus' seeing Jesus' model of, of community with uh, his disciples. We talked about the fact that he, when Jesus developed what he developed with his disciples is embodied in the word community. Living in community with Jesus, the disciples followed his teachings and his example. I told you three things about community on last week, right? I said, number one, community perfects. Everybody say it perfects. In other words, when you're living in community, when you're in cononia with each other, then what it does is it, it helps to, 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 to help transform you because when, when we walk together, how can two walk together simply agree, how can two be in relationship with each other if they're not pulling on each other and encouraging each other to do what's right according to God's word? If you have nobody that you're accountable to, then you just do whatever you want to do. And that's where some people are right now in their walk with the Lord. They don't want to be in community. I'm not saying it's you, but somebody's, somebody in here don't like community because you are so selfish and you want it the way you want it and if it doesn't matter the way Jesus says, I'm going to do life the way I want to do life. I would tell you that's not the attitude of a disciple and you never become a disciple of Christ with a selfish man mentality. Hello? So community perfects. In other words, we end up perfecting each other. We help each other to grow because we encourage one another, we strengthen one another, and we help to correct each other. Second thing we said is community protects. Okay? It protects, and we said thirdly, community preaches. In other words, it preaches from this standpoint, when people see us operating in authentic community, the world will see, like Jesus said, that perfect unity, and the world will know that the Father sent the Son, and that the Father loves them as much as he loves the Son, when they see us do it. So it preaches. It, it, when we're in community, it's, it's the gospel in action. How many of y'all heard the statement, I'd rather uh, uh, see a sermon in a day than hear one? In other words, 
people would rather see you doing this stuff rather than just talking about it. It's easy to talk. It's easy to talk about it in here. Oh, I just love the Lord. He heard my cry. I love everybody, Pastor, until the person that you can't stand. Wants to come in your space. Yeah. Hello? Y'all look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. How many of you got somebody that challenges you in your walk with the Lord? I believe that God will allow us to have people in our lives that way to test us to see if we're really growing or not. Hello? How do you respond? It's easy to talk about this stuff when you're here amongst Christians and everybody is, is, is doing the thing the same way that you're doing it and, and you have like mind. But what about that person that's a little bit different than you? What about that person who, who hadn't quite grown to where God's going to take them to? And maybe, just maybe, God has you in their life to help bring them along, but you can't stand them. And God says, I got you there. I didn't move you from that job because you, you're on assignment to mentor that person that you don't like. And you've been praying to get away for a long time. And God said, uh-uh. You're on assignment. And I'm going to grow you at the same time you're trying to help them to grow. Because God works all things together for our good. To those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. So as we talk about delegation, the, the, the sixth component is delegation. Because we see as Jesus, uh, I told you the first year and a half or so, these, these boys, just, they, they were with Jesus. They were feeding people and, and organizing the crowd, but they didn't do very much ministry. But then there came a point in time where Jesus said, it's time for you to step out and begin to, to do the work of ministry in a way, in a fashion that you've observed me do it for this first year, uh, year and a half, right? In other words, Christians, it's time we're learning this stuff about community. We're preaching it, and I purposely, because I knew a, a lot of folks' minds are messed up in America when it comes to the, to the gospel message, when it comes to race relations, when it comes to Christians getting along. We got our own way of thinking about things. So we theologically and doctrinally showed you what God's plan for his church was. Now, if you choose to think differently, you're thinking differently than God. But yet you say you love Jesus. I, listen, I, I told you before, don't, don't tell me uh, uh, about your faith walk. Let me see it in action. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Because I submit to you that there are a lot of believers who are in self-deception. And I know that because sometimes our minds have not been renewed, it takes us a while to get up to speed. But I would, I would love to take a person whose heart is right, that maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit messed up emotionally, and they're willing to learn. But if you're not willing to learn, if I can show you in the scripture and you're still going to go the way you want to go, listen, baby, I, I'm scared for you. So as your pastor, you, y'all know, y'all, you, some of y'all been here for 25, 30 years. You know me by now. You know, you, now some of y'all newbies, you may not quite know it, but you know me by now. I'm going to show you what the word says. I'm not going to placate it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We're going to talk scripture. We're going to write and divide it. We're going to do our proper exegesis so we can have correct hermeneutical application. That means the back then, we understand what happened back then and how does it apply today. And so this thing on unity, it is, it is a shame that the church has been complicit with the disunity that we see observed amongst Christians. I am not talking about the world I'm talking about church folks. No, I'm not talking about church folks. I'm talking about disciples of Christ. Because if we're going to be disciples of Christ, we can't do life our own way. We're part of the kingdom of God. We are kingdom citizens. As, as a result of being kingdom citizens, we have to operate based on what the king tells us. Okay? So the question becomes, how much do you really love Jesus? I would submit to you that most folks don't love Jesus like they say they do. Can I say it again? I said most Christians don't love Jesus as much as they pretend that they do. (sighs) 
Can I use a modern day illustration? Brother Danny Thomas, you're a sharp looking brother, man. I believe you're a sharp looking brother, man. Look at this dude, man. It's just, it's just smooth. It's, it's suave and debonair. And you're married to your lovely wife, Constance Thomas, right? Now, Danny, uh, y'all been married how long now, sir? Uh, 23 years. 24 years. Been married 24 years. You had to think about it for a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> Danny, you love Constance Thomas, right? But let me ask you a very pointed, personal question in front of this whole audience, and it's going live stream. Are there times that Connie can wear on you a little bit? <laughs> he said, absolutely. <laughs> Connie, are there times when Danny can get under your skin a little bit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but your love for each other, amen, if it's where it needs to be, then you still remember what the scripture tells you, tells you to love her like Christ loved the church. And the scripture tells you to respect him and honor him, right, like you would submit yourself to Christ. And, 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 and the word of God should take precedence over any feelings that we have along the way. Amen. How many of y'all have children? Yeah. Let me see the hand of y'all that have children. How many of y'all, your children have disappointed you along the way? How many of your children have, 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 have made you fight mad? You, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you could, you just kick this choker. Please don't do it, okay? I know you feel like it sometimes. I know it comes up in your spirit. I know you want to just, whoa, whoa. But my point is this. Your love for them is such that if you really love them, uh, you don't kill them. If you love them, even when they mess up, you still are there for them. Doesn't mean you give them everything they want, because sometimes we're hurting our kids, we're enabling them to stay where they are when we give them everything they want. But it means that, that, that when, when the rubber meets the road, when it's overtime, when, it's, when, 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 it's, when the game is on the line, if they can't count on anybody else, they can count on mom and daddy. Love is an action word. And so when we say we love Jesus, we got to get to the point to where we are, we're willing to, to do what he says. We, he begins to delegate authority to us for us to walk according to his will and his word. So we said, number one, uh, in delegation, he assigned them work. Jesus was always building his ministry for the time when his disciples would have to take over his work and go out into the world with the redeeming gospel. This plan was progressively made clear as they followed him. The first uh, uh, invitation to the disciples to follow him has not, says nothing about going out and evangelizing the world, although this was his plan from the very beginning. Because remember, he brought them along. He brought them along. He, he encouraged them. He, he, he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Watch me do this. And guys, that's one of the, the best things in the world you could ever do for your children and for those who you are in relationship with is to have them watch your lifestyle. Now, can we be honest with each other up here? Some, some of y'all come to church and y'all look real nice and pretty and all spiritual when you come. Oh, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Rest your court on about that. In the name of Jesus. We speak in tongues. We shout. Uh, yeah, we hug the sisters and brothers in the church. And the people that live with you sit there looking at you like, I can't believe this jumping. We left home. He was cussing the fuck. We left home and she was just, just meaner than a rattlesnake. And up there at the church. That's why some of your children are resentful about church now because of the way you lived outside of church. Not an excuse, but you make it hard on them when they see you my, you know, praise the Lord, I love the Lord. But then you go home and it's a much different story. Be doers of the word and not hear his own. So Jesus assigned them work. Second point I want you to skip to the second point. He gave them briefing instructions. You know, briefing instructions are sort of like talking points, if you will, in the political realm. You ever notice that uh, during the political season, 
all the Democrats be saying the same thing and all the Republicans be saying the same thing. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing. And to me, it's asinine because there's not individuality in a lot of those cases because what, that, that doesn't happen by accident, guys. I've worked in the political realm before just for nine months long enough to know that this is crazy. <laughs> but they, they send them talking points. So they'll know what to say and, and, and how to respond the same way given whatever scenario that they're dealing with. I would submit to you that, that God's word should be our talking points to the point that when we go out and face the world, we ought to be saying the same thing, all things being equal. When I say saying the same thing, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one coming to the Father except by him. Well, Brother Pastor, eh, that's, that's been a little exclusive, isn't it? Well, that's what he just said. Either what he said is true or it's not. Well, Brother Pastor, there, there are many ways to God. And how dare you say that Jesus is the way? That's what he said. Either he, if, if he said it, then he, he's, he lied. If, he, if, if it's not true, he lied. And my God cannot lie. Jesus was God manifested in human flesh. So he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. So we ought to have some talking points based off of Scripture, not your denomination, not your family of origin, not how you were brought up, and not based on what you went through. Because, see, what people would do is because they had a bad experience, whether it was a racial experience, whether it was a marital experience. Now, you, you tell everybody, child, I wouldn't do it. Don't do it, dummy. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get married. Just do your thing out there. You, you can go and do your thing and you be free and, and, and don't, don't do it. Well, the Bible says marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. Yes. And what I'm saying is the institution of marriage is honorable because God created it, the family unit, and just because you had a bad experience don't mean that marriage is bad. It's the folks in the marriage. It's the people in the institution that are crazy sometimes. And the truth be told, some of y'all need to start picking better. You ever notice you keep getting the same kind of dude? You keep running up on the same kind of woman? Maybe y'all spend some time in prayer. Maybe y'all spend some time getting yourself girded up in the Holy Ghost, getting yourself perfected in the things of God before you go and start to join, trying to join yourself with anybody else. Amen? It's time for us to grow. So what are the briefings? So first of all, he, he, he first reaffirmed his purpose for their lives. Go to Luke 9, 1 through 2, real quickly. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 through 2. He first reaffirmed his purpose for their life. How many of y'all know God has a purpose for each one of us? We've been saved and we've been left here, not just so we can look cute and pretty. We've been saved and left us so that we can be utilized by God to reach others with the gospel message. God chose to use man to preach and not angels. He chose to use us. The text says one that Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Watch this next verse. He gave him power. He gave him authority. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He reaffirmed his purpose for their lives. Back up to verse number one again. Let's read it out loud and on purpose. Can you all read with me? He says this. One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples. Now remember, they've been following him, observing him for about a year and a half or so with basically not doing very much meaningful, meaningful service uh, in ministry except for baptizing a few folks. That's what we learned last week. One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them, gave them what? Power and authority to cast out all demons. Do you not realize as a born-again believer you, you have authority when you're filled with the Holy Spirit to cast out demons? And whether you realize or not, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. We don't talk about this enough in our, in our individual settings, but sometimes we're dealing with a demon. Can y'all go to Ephesians? 
Come on, thank you, Holy Ghost. Ephesians, I know, I know I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, but go to Ephesians chapter number 6, I believe it is. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter number 6. Thank you. Uh, verse, let's start, um, start at verse number 10. Ephesians 6, verse number 10. Whether you realize or not, we're engaged in spiritual warfare. And you cannot fight spiritually with earthly or carnal weaponry. And many of y'all haven't recognized when it's a spirit behind the person, you attack the person rather than going after the spirit behind the person. Are you with me? You sit there and you get so frustrated and you, you don't realize that's a demon. <laughs> just, 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 just moving and having this way with that person, but you, you can't quit cussing them out. You can cuss a demon all day long, he ain't going nowhere. He's not going anywhere. Can I say that grammatically correct? Because it's spiritual warfare that we got to learn how to engage in. Take this, the final word. Paul writing to this church in Ephesus, be strong in the Lord and in his, be strong where? In the Lord and in your mighty power. His mighty power. Look, look at what it says in verse number 11. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. The devil has strategy. He has, and guys, listen to me. His strategy, uh, his strategy, we, we can map it because we, we've seen it historically from the Holy Scripture from years gone by, and we see it in our, even our life today. He used the same stuff, but somehow, We'll, go, we'll run blindly into the same strategy that he used uh, for, for thousands of years. Guys, listen, study how to do God's word and his will and, and understand what the enemy shoots at you and, and know the area where you are vulnerable at. Next verse, let's read. It says what? For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, there it is, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark well and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now go to the KJV and when you go to the KJV, watch this because many of us have misunderstood what it was saying in the KJV. Most of us don't speak uh, King James English. That's why I like to use, again, I like to use the New Living Translation, King James Bible. I'm going to say it again. There's no magic in KJV. Now, if that's what your conviction is, you only want to read the KJV, so be it. I preach from it quite, I used to preach from it quite a bit, and I still do. When I, that's my study Bible, is a KJV Bible. But there's no magic in KJV. Because KJV was translated from the original Greek and Hebrew. And so it's just a translation at the time that King James on the throne. I got to say that because some people hear me and say, well, that, that ain't what the KJV said. Listen, the NLT is, is, is I love to use it, uh, but, I, but I'm not married to it. Because you don't talk in King, how many of y'all talk in King James English? <laughs> Honey, thus thou wantest to make it love it tonight? <laughs> Tyrone, you didn't tell Nancy that, did you? She's pregnant again, so I don't know what, you may have said it. <laughs> I couldn't let that one go by. <laughs> y'all know I love y'all, don't you? All right. Some of y'all I can't joke with like this. Some, But, but watch this. I've heard people say before, well, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, that's, that's them folks in high places, wickedness in the Congress. Yes, yeah, it is wickedness, but that's not what it's talking about. These are different classifications of demonic spirits. Yes, yes, yes. Are y'all with me? Yes. He's giving you different classifications of demonic spirits because all demonic spirits aren't at the same level. Just like all angelic beings aren't the same level. Michael was an archangel. Yeah. That means he has a little more power and authority than some of those lower angels. But he's giving you the different classifications of demonic spirit. That's who we battle against. The sin of racism is a spiritual issue. And we keep trying to fight it with physical weaponry. 
and you will never change the heart of man with a law. That's why Jesus came, because the law could not make us holy. Now, I'm not saying it's, you know, we, we need to have laws in the book for wrongdoers, but how, you gonna, how, how, can you, how can you look in somebody's heart and know what they, what they, what's in their heart? It's, that's why it's hard to prove certain things. So you better try to look at challenging this the way the scripture says challenge it. Because if I get your heart right toward God and you love Jesus, understand his word, his will, then you can't hate your brother. If you do, you, you, you don't know my God. Let's go, God. My time is running. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not part of it, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now he goes on and begins, and I, I don't have time to go down, but read it when you get home. He begins to list the different armor that we are to enclose ourselves with so we are prepared to fight in spiritual warfare. The average Christian is ill-equipped to do spiritual warfare. That's why we keep getting knocked over and knocked down. All right, so, so let's go. So he, he reaffirmed his purpose. Number two, he told them who to see first. Go to Matthew 10. Now, again, this is, this is, this is really important because God, God had an order in which the gospel message was being pushed out into the world. Look at what he says in Matthew 10, and we're going back to the NLT, Matthew the 10th chapter, verses 5 through 6. He told them who to see first. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Now, how many of y'all know it's important to do what Jesus tells you and not make up your own rules? How many of you know and understand that your feelings got to be put on the back burner and your obedience got to ride to the top? I know for a fact that when I start preaching this series on building a mother ethnic church, some of y'all had a little attitude. Can I come this side of here? Because y'all ain't going to be honest. Somebody had an attitude. Because you, were, you, were, you approach the scripture from your experience and what you have been through rather than saying, okay, God, what are you saying for my life? What are you, what's your plan for your church? And how can I walk in obedience to your word? You're like, I, I just, I, 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 I don't trust nobody. I don't, they don't look like me. I don't trust them. All I want to know is, are you willing to, to grow in the Word? I want to know, are you willing to, to be obedient to what God's Word says? And your little feelings, some of y'all are very feely, feely, touchy, touchy. <laughs> touchy, touchy, feely, feely. I love you, but you just, you just, just your little feeling just takes over. And then you forget about what God's Word says, and, and, and you, if you're not careful, you'll get so engrossed in how you feel and what you think, you'll ignore what God's word says. And it can be plainly explained to you that God's plan for his church all along was to bring Jew and Gentile together into one body. Out of two people, he's going to make him one people group. Okay, y'all still with me? Watch what he says here. So everybody say, get out your feelings and get in the word. I think we need to repeat that. Get out your feelings and get in the Word. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Remember, this is the initial sending out of his apostles. They've watched him. He says, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Gentiles was anybody that was not a Jew, and Samaritans was half Jewish and half Gentile. Okay. We would say they were mixed today, right? Mixed race, all right? Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Watch what he says here. But only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. That was, that was, that was a pattern to God's plan. Are y'all with me today? He told them who to see first. Now, we know that the gospel was going throughout all the world, but when they first went out, 
He sent them to his own people, their own people, right? Because most of these guys were Jewish. So go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. Didn't mean that the gospel wasn't going to go to them. Now, I hear people, and I've heard people say this here recently, that when my mission is to my people, and I only speak to black people, I only speak to white people, where did you get that from? The gospel is for all. Now, I, I, granted, you ought to start in your own house first. If you start in your own house first, but how dare you come up with a mindset that says, I'm only going to share the gospel with people that look like me. God had an order in rolling out the gospel message. And we saw it in our study. You go through Ephesians, you see Paul's letter. Um, the gospel is for everybody. Are y'all with me today? He told them who to see first. Third briefing point was he told them to trust God to supply their needs. Look at verses, let's go, let's go on down to verses, uh, um, verse 9 through 15. Watch it. He told them to, to, to trust God to supply their needs. He did this for a reason, guys, because you will never trust God until you have to trust God. That went over somebody's head, didn't it? You'll never trust God until you have to trust God. Because trust means that I, I don't have another option. Too many Christians are, are depending on their parents, they're depending on their loved ones, they're depending on fellow church members. But God has a way of putting us in a position to where the, the only place that we have to look is up toward him. I don't know if you ever had in those situations in your life, but I certainly have. Look at what the text says here. Don't take any money in your money belts, no gold, silver, or even copper coins. Now, I guess, you got to understand context, but some people will take this and say, well, that's, that's what Jesus said, told him to do, so that's what I'm going to do. I ain't going to take no money. Everybody say, you need some money to do ministry. Say, Jesus had a treasurer. Why do you have a treasure if they didn't need money? This air is working pretty good today, isn't it? Thank you, Mike Miles, for keeping us up to, up to speed. But this, this air is working pretty good. But you know what? It costs, it costs to have cool air. Swepco, I promise you, every month, the bill comes. And for this building alone, right now it's around 800 something bucks a month, but in the summertime, this building alone, not the other three or four we got, but this building alone, the, the electric bill on this building could be twelve to $1,300 a month on this building to keep you cool in the summertime. Summer breeze. Oh. <laughs> Had a flashback there, Yvonne. All right, all right. So it takes money to operate to do ministry. It takes money to buy material. It takes money to get these cameras that show good quality. It, take, it took money to buy this screen. It took money to build this building. It takes money to support missions and the outreach efforts that we support. We can tell them we're praying for them. But you pray for them too and, and support them. If, come on now. Are y'all with me today? All right, so, so he told him, trust God. He said, so don't take any money in your, so don't take any money in your money belts, no gold. Obviously they had money because they wouldn't have a money belt if you never had money. Why you need a purse or a wallet if you never had money? Think about it for a second. He's trying to teach them to trust him. No gold, silver, or even copper coins. Next verse. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Those who deserve to be fed. Those who are working in ministry deserve to be fed. Okay, that's what he's saying. Next verse, let's read. It says, whenever you're in a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. Right, back up. 
I know we have hotels today, but back in this time, hotels were places of ill repute. A lot of prostitution went on in those hotels. All right? So, so the, the, as they went about doing the work of ministry, and these, of course, they didn't have a hotel in every corner like we do today. So it was incumbent upon those who were in the faith to host those who were doing the work of ministry. My question to you is, if an evangelist came to town, could he stay? Would you have a chamber that he could stay in your house? But for pastor, you know, my house is just, you know, it's, uh, you, know you stay in there. <laughs> let me, let me t can I say something to y'all? Don't ever be embarrassed about what the Lord has blessed you with. It may not be a big mansion, but keep it clean. God bless you to put food in the cabinets. And if God lays up on your heart to host somebody, host them. I just wonder if, if a hurricane struck New Orleans again and we had 50 people that came up here and didn't have a place to shelter, I wonder could I find 50 homes in this church that would host somebody? Yeah, I'm looking at you. There is something that's called the ministry of hospitality. Because we get so, we get so ingrained. We like stuff. I, I, I feel you. I, I like my privacy too. If I want to walk through the house with no clothes, I want to be able to walk through the house with no clothes. I don't do that very often. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at each other like, I do, Pastor. <laughs> I, I, I remember uh, uh, this is back when Hurricane... Y'all stop it. Stop, stop it. Y'all, y'all, y'all. Get your mind out together. I remember when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, and we, um, Maria and I uh, hosted, uh, y'all know Mel Parker, Mel's uh, aunt and her husband, Uncle Lord. He passed, went on to be with the Lord here just recently. But we hosted them for about four or five months, I believe, um, until they were able to go back down there. But I, but you know what, that experience was, was a very enriching and rewarding experience because we got a chance to connect with people who would probably otherwise would not have ever stayed at our house. So my question to you is, would you show the ministry of hospitality if asked? I, just don't, I don't want you to raise your hand, okay? Just, just, just ponder that because if the Lord bless you with the house, remember you, we prayed for that house you got? And you said, Lord, thank you. And however you want to use me, use me. You can use this house, God, however you want to use it, until he said, I want to use it. You, oh, no, wait, wait, God, wait, God, it's mine. <laughs> Any of y'all kids ever did you that way? You buy some fries and you want some fries that you bought them? <laughs> and they don't want to give you some of the fries? They hot, crispy, good. And they get an attitude, the fries you brought them. None of y'all kids do that, right? Can we keep reading, y'all? Whenever you enter a city or village, watch this, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it's not, take the blessing back. <laughs> See, you said it, I did. Can we keep reading? I don't have time to unpack that. But you, you go study it out. If, <laughs> back up. Look at what he says. Watch this, guys. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it's not, take, the back, take back the blessing. <laughs> Keep reading. Well, Jesus was bad. When, if any household or town refuses to welcome you, listen to, or, or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. Some of y'all waste a whole lot of time with people who aren't studying you. Can I stay that way? My, 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 uh, my, my, my wife's cousin and, and Mama Kirk's uh, uh, nephew is, is Bobby Rush, the blues singer. And Bobby Rush had a, had a song saying, I ain't studying you. And that, that means I'm not studying you. Or that's, that's a colloquial phrase to say that what you're saying don't matter to me. I'm not studying you. Sometimes we waste a lot of time, even within the church, in trying to groom people who are disinterested in being discipled. I tell you, I, I love, I've learned this. I love every last one of y'all, 
and, and I'm, I will pastor you to the day you die, to the day I die. But some of y'all are disinterested in being a disciple. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to, come on, please, 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 like James Brown. No, it ain't please, please, please. Because everywhere in the scripture where you see Jesus calling people to follow him, he never begged them. So some of y'all are disinterested in being a disciple. You want to be a church member. And if you die, you're going to heaven, but you're not, you, you, you're not, going, to be very, you're not going to be very useful in, in, in advancing kingdom principles because you're not willing to be discipled. And I understand that. I love you, but I can't beg you for the next year to sign up for a class that's going to help you grow in your faith. Think about that for a second. You said you love Jesus. You say this is the place that God sent you. I didn't say it. You said it. But then when, when the order of the house is that we're going to help, we're going to disciple, and part of the discipling is, is that, that you connect with our discipleship training, but you won't do it. Oh, God, oh I'm so busy. I wish I could just, I, I, here's what I would challenge you to do. Just sit down and, and just chronological, just make a chronological order of your day and see how much time you spend doing this. I promise you, most of y'all spend more time on social media. Just go back. I, th I think social media, Facebook especially has a tool. You can go and look and see how much time you spend on social media. Just do that. And then compare that to how much time you spend in your word. <sighs> Pastor, why are you picking on me? I didn't say it was you. If the shoe fit, what do we tell you to do? Grow out of it. Stop wearing it. Grow out of it. All right? If any household or tower refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake this dust from your feet as you leave. Verse 15. I tell you the truth. The wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. We, we waste a lot of time with people who are disinterested in pursuing the things of God. Now, listen to what I'm talking about here. Because they, they were going to these certain towns, and, 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 and as they were going about doing the work of ministry, there were some that, that they could not convince to participate in the work of ministry. So Jesus says, shake the dust off your feet. Okay? You still love people, but, but don't let people disturb your peace because they're displaying their stubbornness or lack of willingness to connect. I can still love you and know where you are. Okay? And so that frees me to go on and pour into people who really are interested in growing. Because some people, all they want to do is get to heaven. As long as they get there, they don't care about anybody else. But God says, I saved you to use you. In order to use you, I got to train and develop you. But you don't want to be trained and developed. But Pastor, I, 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 I said when I left high school, I'm going to open another book. Did you really say that? That your learning was, was, was complete? Baby, life is a lifelong journey, a lifelong education. At 58, I know more stuff than I did at 40. And I thank God that I know more now. I wish I knew now when I was 22 and first got married. If I knew now what I knew at 22 when I first got married, Maria and I wouldn't have went through some of the stuff we went through. If I knew now. Can I get two witnesses out there? Amen. How many of y'all knew, if you knew what you knew now, those who've been coming to marriage fellowship, that your marriage would have been a lot sweeter, a lot longer? Amen. Right? Amen. We grow. All of us have grown. Some of y'all aren't as mean as you used to be <laughs> because you've been filled with the Holy Ghost now. Some of y'all not as stubborn as you used to be. And some of y'all still are. <laughs> and God's got to deal with you. So he gave him briefly a second. Number three, follow his methods. Look at, look, at, look at verse number 11 there of that 10th chapter. In effect, the disciples were told to concentrate their time on the most promising individuals in each town who would thereby be able to follow up their work after they had gone. Because it's about pouring into people so they can pour into people. See, I know, hear me carefully, as I look at my 
I thank God for coming up this, this fourth Sunday. We'll be celebrating 33 years of ministry. I thank God for 33 years of ministry, but I know that I won't be here for another 33 years. If I would, I'd be 91. I have no intention of, of passing the church at 91. Well, you don't know what the Lord is going to do. I do know. <laughs> I'm not saying ministry is going to stop. But, but you, here, here, here's what we got to understand. We got to be pouring into those who are coming in behind us. And we can't be so territorial to where we, we don't want them to learn anything because we're scared they may do better. I want you to do better than me. I want you to be go higher than I'm going. Because I'm not going to be here for another 30, 30 who knows? I'm a, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to be here at, at, at 90 trying to do something that, that my season has passed and the church dies out. I've, I've, I've said this before and I've said it again. I don't want this church to be full of all golden vessels. I love my golden vessels, but is everybody, is Mama Kirk's age 91, is Henry 88, right? Does him, you 88? There are certain things they can't do right now. But they, they serve the time. And I want them to have uh, uh, the, 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 the fulfillment of being able to, to just sit down and just soak up ministry. And we, we bring them in and help, let them help where they can. And then we serve them. Are y'all with me? So that means that we got to train some, some of those coming in behind us. We, we, we can't just keep, keep doing ministry the way we've always done it. We gotta be, we gotta, we gotta, the message doesn't change, but the method has to. Y'all have heard me say that time and time again. Many churches fail to continue to reach the community because we ain't do, we, we've been doing BTU this way for 50 years, and by God, we ain't going to change. It's two of y'all there at BTU. <laughs> Something ought to click in your head and say, we're not being effective. Something ought to, ought, 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 ought to make you say, we got to do it differently. So we're always evaluating how to do the work of ministry, okay? But I love my golden vessels. But I just, I mean, I just don't want to be one. I mean, I don't want to be 90 trying to do something that, that my season has passed. So I'm pouring, I'm trying to pour into all, all y'all, those that come behind. Because one day, Doyle Adams got to leave. This earth, if the rapture tarries, and this pulpit, if I get too old. Okay. Number four, expect hardship. Can I finish this? Expect hardship. The fact that some people will refuse the disciples' ministry only highlighted Jesus' warning of the treatment they could expect to receive. Look at 17 and 18. Guys, listen, ministry can be hard sometimes. And so don't think that everybody's going to like you. I got over that a long time ago. As a matter of fact, that never really moved me. Because I, I was never one who, who, want, who, who desired the pats on the back. I just, that just didn't move me. Now, it, it, it's, it's good for us to exhort people, to encourage them and tell them they did a good job. Do that. But don't, don't do ministry looking for that. Look at the text. But beware. For you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogue. We don't see this in America so much, but you go to some of these other foreign countries where, 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 where uh, the Muslim faith is, is, is the predominant faith and you try to go out there and talk about Christianity. Some of those folks have been crucified, cut up, cut up uh, split in two, hung, all kinds of turmoil that Christians are going through. For you will be handed over to the courts and be flogged with whips in the, in the synagogue. Next verse says this, you will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. Not stand trial because you did something crazy, but because you're following Jesus. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers, the rulers and other unbelievers about me. So when you are called out or dressed down, that's your opportunity to tell about the God that you serve. So expect hardship. Look at neighbor and say, neighbor, it's not going to always be easy. Number five, it was a dividing gospel. Okay? Jesus reminded them of the decisive nature of the gospel invitation. There could be no compromise with sin. And for this reason, anyone holding out on God was sure to be disturbed by their preaching. See, I've discovered this. 
Most people like preaching until the preaching hits their sin. Most of y'all like me until I say something that, 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 that makes your feeling rise up. Is that the truth? Most of y'all love your spouse until the spouse tells you something about you that's really true. But you don't want to hear that truth. I know sometimes I get mad in the wet hen at Maria when she point out my stuff. How many of y'all spouses are experts at studying you? Come on. They know you better than anybody else. They sleep with your doggone tail. They, 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 they're with you all the time. Y'all go places together and they observe your character. They observe you when you're not around other people. So they, they know you. They know your strengths and your weakness. So when they point things out, don't look at it as them trying to hurt you, but look at it as them trying to help you. Because they'll tell you stuff that nobody else will tell you. Everybody else will go and talk about you when you leave. Child, the child here, Deacon Charles, he thought he could sing. He was just wearing back. <laughs> Sorry about that, Deacon Charles. You can raise the hymn and see if, if I call one, can't you? Big Charles can raise a hymn. Y'all know what raising him in? I love the Lord. He heard my cry. There we go. There we go. We got some old school here, okay? All right. But guys, don't, 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 don't run people out of your life who love you enough to speak truth into your life. And I pray as your pastor you understand, that you understand that I, my love for you is such that I want to see God's very best in you. And so when I, when I teach you, when I'm sharing, I want to be, I want to be honest. I want to, I want to share, share in a plain way so that we can all grow together. Because none of us are perfect. We're all striving to be like Jesus, I hope. All right, last. Number six. He encouraged him to be one with Christ. The point Jesus made in all these instructions was that the mission of his disciples was not different in principle or method from his own. He began by giving them his own authority and power to do his work. And he closed by assuring them that what they were doing was as though he were doing it himself. Think about that for a second. When you do it, it's as if Jesus is doing it himself. We are co-laborers together in Christ because we have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Okay? So lesson learned. A person must first be trained, then he can become qualified to serve. Quit sending folk out and they just got saved. We, 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 historically, we've been bad about that as a church because we just want a warm body. And then we'll send people to go do stuff that they're not qualified or have been trained to do. All of us need to be able to succinctly and in a simple manner be able to tell people about how our conversion experience and be able to tell them how to get saved. We should be able to know more than just, well, just come to church. My pastor's going to tell you. No. You are there, and they may, they, they may never step foot inside the doors of this church, and you need to be qualified to tell them how to get saved. Number two, the major prerequisite for ministry is to be with Jesus, learning from him and his word, and communing with him in prayer and in quietness. I give you scripture reference there. You can look those up. I don't have time to go today. The third thing I tell you is public ministry requires two forms of preparation or training. Number one, private preparation with Christ. In other words, being with him all along. There are too many people who are not spending private time with Christ and want to get up and, and do stuff publicly. That's where I get back to the discipleship training, spending time in the Word. The Word renews our mind, okay? And public preparation or formal training involves observing and learning from Christ as he ministers through others. We can observe others as they do the work of ministry and then work alongside them. And at some point in time, we're released to go into ministry ourselves. So guys, Jesus delegated authority to his followers. And we'll pick up on these, uh, on next week, these last two on, on our, on our, on our uh, outline for community uh, as we observe Jesus as he interfaced with his disciples. I love you guys, and I pray that something was said that will help you today, okay? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this privilege and this honor. We thank you for giving us the ability to share gospel truths in a plain and understandable way. You are an awesome God, and we love you. 
God, I pray that you will help us to grow in our faith. Help us to be the type of disciple that you desire for us to be. God, we love you and we thank you for this time and this privilege. We magnify you today and we're willing to walk in our delegated authority. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Glory to God. Now listen, I want to I want to just I want to give a, a invitation for prayer today. If you want to be saved, hey, see me see me immediately after the altar. We we we'll we'll, we'll, we'll walk you through the process of salvation. If you're listening via live stream and want to be saved, listen, three steps of salvation. Recognize that you lost and need to be saved. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and he died on the cross of Calvary for you, was buried and resurrected the third day morning according to scripture. And then thirdly, yield your will to his, his and invite him into your heart to save you. I promise you he'll come in and take up residence. He loves you. He's just waiting for you to invite him in. So if you want to be saved, pray that prayer. Meet me at, at the altar. If God is placing your heart to become a part of this fellowship, let's talk at the altar. Amen. But I want to pray for any and everybody. Just lift your hands where you are if you have a specific prayer need. Maybe you struggle with getting into your word and, and on a consistent basis. Maybe you struggle with letting your feelings override you rather than the word of God being the dominant force in your life. Maybe you're struggling with a, a, a situation, um, whether, it, whether it be monetarily, whether it be with another believer, maybe it's a family member that you're struggling with and you, you, you guys are at odds and you just need prayer for that situation. Maybe it's sickness in your body. Lift your hands where you are. I want to pray for you right now. God is able to do it. I've seen him do it before and I know he'll do it again. Just trust him. He'll provide. Let's pray. God, we thank you right now for these saints with hands raised here and those who are listening via live stream. God, we know that you can do anything except fail because you are a God who knows all and who has all power in heaven and earth in his hand. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would just bless each one of us and bless those with hands raised, God. You know the individual situation. You know what they're dealing with. You know what the challenge is in their life, God. Lord, we face challenges all the time, but we have you abiding on the inside of us so we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. God, great is he that's in us and he's in the world. So Lord, we trust and believe that you will see us through. Now Lord, touch in a mighty way. Touch the hearts and the minds of those uh, who are facing these challenges today, Lord. You called us, Lord, to be a disciple. You called us to be trained to go out and to reach others. And Lord, Give us a passion and desire for lost soul. So much so, God, that we can't rest when we're in the presence of someone who does not know you. Father, we love you now and we praise you and we thank you for this privilege and this honor. Bless and strengthen each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's children said amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Bless you, bless you.